Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Film Club Podcast, where every week, me and Miss Boo bring a movie to the table. Sometimes that's good, sometimes it's bad, but it's always fun at the Film Club. Miss Boo, how are you doing? I'm doing good today, Dean. How are you doing? I'm doing great this week because, well, we get to watch uh, one of the best movies of all time. Well, not only that, it's also July, so we're kicking off July with a new theme month. We are, and this month's theme is Great Cinematic Heroes, because, you know, July, America, 4th of July. 4th of July is in a couple of days from now. It is, and uh, I think I picked a pretty good one this week to kick it off with. You did, and do you want to tell everybody what your pick for the week is? Yes, so for Great Cinematic Heroes, I decided to pick the number one cinematic hero according to the afi top 100 heroes of all time and that is atticus finch in to kill a mockingbird played by gregory peck a really good movie very good movie and uh to give a little context for those who may not know too much about this uh this movie came out in 1962 it was a really big success when it came out uh it ranked in number six at the box office at the end of that year um the number one film was the longest day which Some people probably don't know, but they definitely know the number two film, which is Lawrence of Arabia. Really good film. Really good film. We might do it later on this month, but who knows. But We'll we'll see. The other big thing is what else came out this year? It was the spawn of Bond. James Bond. This is actually the first year where we got a James Bond film. That's true. Yeah. So that's kind of a little bit what's going on here. There's also other more politically charged things that, that... I guess the state of the world is in 1962 that this film directly deals with. Yeah. Namely, like, the civil rights movement, which is basically on its way, on like, starting at this at this point. Um, and racism in America is about to take a very um, new approach, I guess, because of, you know, stuff. Yeah, yeah, we're not a politics podcast. No, we're not. We're a movie podcast. And, and uh, that's about all I'm going to give for you. Yeah, we're not going to get into that so much. But, yeah, let's kick it off. Well, let's, you know, talk about this AI5 top 100 movie mm-hmm. that was, you know, based on a Pulitzer Prize winning book by Harper Lee. Her only book up until her death when they released the sequel. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm going to say this right now, the sequel to The Kill Mockingbird you probably don't want to wa- don't want to read that one, if yep. I'm being honest with you. I never read it. I, I always enjoyed the actual book. I was like, why am I gonna sully that with something that's new or well, not even well, it, new. It's written by the same it author, is. but it's written, God, I think fifty years post hand. Well, it's it's an accumulation of note that was supposed to come out first. It was supposed mm-hmm. to be the first book in the series that wasn't really a series. But it's also colors Atticus Finch in a totally different light, yeah. which is kind of like finding out Gandhi hit his kids. It's it's like that kind of tonal shift. Yeah, that's why it's like, just stick with the original book. And we're going to stick with the original movie. That's right. So, where do you want to start here? Let's start from the beginning. Long ago, when Harper Lee was a young girl, <laughs> okay, she not basically that, not told a story <laughs> about her dad. <laughs> Her dad, who seemed to be, you know, the be-all dad, because like, he was out there protecting the people. Exactly. So, that that's kind. That's from what I, my understanding of the story to Kill a Mockingbird. It's a vaguely, it's like a thinly veiled um, nostalgia trip for Harper Lee, like recollection her, of her father. Yeah, it, is and that her childhood? Correct? Yeah. Okay. It's almost an autobiography, but not. At the same time. Yeah, from my understanding, it's just a lot of her own experiences were taken and put into the book directly. Yeah. Um, it's still a work of fiction, if I'm not mistaken. Like, it, like details are the same, but the whole work itself is a fictitious, is fictitious tale. Yeah, because these people aren't real. They're based upon real people, and they're based upon real events that were happening in the world at this time. Because the film takes place in the 30s? I believe 35? So... You know, it's... Actually, no. It, it might take place in, like, actual, like, 31. I think the Depression is still, like, really hardcore yeah. going on right now. Because I think they make a note that 
um, Atticus Finch, when Scout, his daughter, asked him, are we poor? And he's like, yes, we, we are. Mm-hmm. Are we as poor as those other families? Like, no, we're a different kind of poor. Yeah. Which is interesting. Because, okay, I got a, I got a question for you. Because yeah. this is not a... Atticus Finch is not a slick bit city lawyer. He's no. very much a, a very... Is he the only lawyer in this town? I mean, it seems like it, but we also... He's also... Um, the defending lawyer. So we do have... We have a prosecutor. So, yeah, there has to be other lawyers. But I think Atticus Finch is, like, the top lawyer to have in this town. Well, I'm not even going with quality. I mean, the population of this rural... Mm-hmm. I, I, is it, like, in Alabama or Oklahoma? Yeah, it's in Alabama. I, I don't remember the city in Alabama, but it's in Alabama. I don't even think it's a city. It seems to me like it's... A like town? A, yeah, like a small town. Like a really small township. Yeah, it could be. So, I, it is interesting because I don't... These kind of places, do they still even exist? What, small towns? Well, small towns like this, where, like, you you know your local lawyer because you see him at church, and he's one of, like, five lawyers oh, I'm that sure are in is. that town. They're, yeah. Okay. I mean, America's a big place. We have big towns, big cities, small towns, so I'm, I'm sure there's... Still small towns around where it's, you know... A little bit closer to this kind of thing going on. Yeah, where, you know, there's a couple of lawyers or one lawyer. You know, there's the the one barber shop. There's the the general store. Yeah, and I guess that's the first thing I want to make note of in the movie. Is this is a a very specific picture of of an Americana town. Yeah. From generations before we're even watching this and generations before this film is even made Mm -hmm. right because i think if i have the timeline right this is supposed to be like about 30 years before like the present day that this film is being shown in so Mm -hmm. i guess it's like half a nostalgia trip for some people but we'll we'll get to the actual story now okay so boo we get started it's the story of this little girl scout Mm -hmm. and her brother jim growing up in this depression era town while their dad atticus is appointed to defend a black man against a alleged rape case Mm -hmm. and we learn a lot about prejudice we learn a lot about how um harsh the world is how very harsh the world could be and even and even when good men try and do good things sometimes it just doesn't work Mm -mm. and it is incredibly fascinating and heartbreaking and wonderful very heartbreaking yeah so that do you want to elaborate any more on the story than that or do you think this is one of those the stories permeated enough of pop culture or just culture in general. People kind of know they get know yeah. The gist. You know, I'm pretty sure that people know a good amount about To Kill a Mockingbird because I'm pretty sure people in high school are still reading about this. Uh, from my understanding, yeah, I didn't have to read it in high school. We did. Yeah, I never actually read the book. I own it. Mm-hmm. I have it. I I think I have like a really old copy of it. Mm-hmm. But I've never gotten a chance to read it. I think my grandmother, like, my grandmother loves this film. And I think she's read the book a Mm -hmm. couple of times. And she's a big fan. Yeah. So, but I've never had a chance to read it. I I recommend it. It's a really good book. Uh, You know, having to read books in high school, it's just like, oh my god, you're going to make me read like a hundred pages of this a night. And then this book was, it really keeps you, you know, engrossed in the story. And it's the same with the film. I can't even get you to read, I can't even get you to read a comic book. That's not true. I can read comic books. Well, yeah, but you won't read any I recommend to you. Uh, some of your picks are a little, I gave little dicey. You, I gave you Fahrenheit 451 three years ago. Haven't even cracked cracked past the three-page mark. I did. I just misplaced the book somewhere in my room. But to get back to our story here. Yes, our story here. Where would you like to lead off first? Well, I think the biggest one is to give the context that... This is a story about kids coming to terms with the reality around them. Yeah. Because Scout and Jim, they're, like, Scout's the main character. Yeah, right? Scout's the main character. And I think a lot of people get confused where they think, well, Atticus Finch, Gregory Peck, he, he's the main guy. He's yeah. not really, I think. 
I want to say Gregory Peck is only in this movie a cumulative maybe like 30 minutes, 45 minutes, something like that? Probably. Yeah, because we're supposed to be seeing the world through the, the eyes of the children of this town. Yeah, and I think that also goes into why Atticus seems like the best human being. Yeah. It's filtered through not only nostalgia that Harper Lee has for her, like... For her father. For her father, probably, and for, like, that kind of time in her life, but also... In the filmmaking sense, we're seeing it also filtered through, you know, all these people who are like, we need to make this guy not only the ultimate, like, good dad character, yeah. but just the most decent human being we you could find. And, I mean, it, it's great on casting when they casted uh, Gregory Peck because mm -hmm. he's such a calming presence that it's, you know, it really makes you feel like everything is better because he's back in the scene. Well, it's just because it's Gregory Peck, and this is how Gregory Peck talks. No, that, now, that, that, is, that, that wasn't a good... That is how Gregory decision. Peck starts talking once he gets into, like, the 70s and the mm -hmm. 80s and stuff. Look, I'm just saying this. Gregory Peck played Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird, and he never stopped playing Atticus Finch in any other movie. I mean, strong character. It's a strong character. There's a, there's a reason the guy, they pegged this guy... To, like, help get people elected president in, like, presidential ads. Yeah. I'm pretty sure people people voted for, you know, whoever just because Atticus Finch told them to. But, Maybe. besides the point. We weren't there for that, so yeah. who knows? But, yeah, so the story of this movie is very interesting. And it, this is the thing. It's hard for me to talk about it because it's a little disjointed in some places. Because we have a whole story point. Mm -hmm. about Scout hating dresses and having to go to school. And then we have the really important part that everybody remembers, which is the court case. Yeah. And I'm like, the court case is only like a third-ish of this movie. Yeah, it's a very small portion of the film. Yeah. It's mostly about, you know, dealing with the everyday life of Scout and Jem and growing up. And it's, we don't come, you know, full circle where we see them grow into adults. We stay... In their childhood. I think the whole movie only takes place over the course so, of... Like I, a year, I think? I think so. Like one summer... Like one summer to to the next. Mm -hmm. And it is fascinating because they get into their hijinks, you know, meeting the new kid uh, in town. Dill. Dill, which... Okay. We watched this movie together. Yeah. Which, I know, we don't usually watch a lot of movies for the podcast together just due to schedule and like... Us, we both have to try and chill out time to watch these. Yeah. But I did notice every time Dill came on screen, that was the moment I noticed Boo look at her phone. Did you just not like Dill? No, I've just seen this movie a handful of times that I'm able to know what's going on. Oh, oh, I see. I see. Yeah. But on, on the other and hand... And I also, I'm also taking my notes during the movie, too. Yes. But again, did you like Dill? Yeah, I like Dill. I mean, I felt sorry for him that... You know, he's always making up a story about his dad who, you know, he became wealthy with the railroad and someday he's going to come back and pick him up, you know, whether in his plane or on a train. Right, that, I was going to ask you that, because it's implied that, like, He's Dill's a latchkey a, kid? No, he's abandoned. Like, yeah. he lives with his aunts. Like, I think his well, dad Well, he just comes for failed. the summer. He comes for the summer? Is that what it is? Yeah, that's his thing. They send him out there for the summer so he can spend time with his aunt and his uncle. But we never really hear anything about his mom. We just hear about... My dad's going to come back, so... Because, okay, is his... That's I guess that's what I'm asking. His dad's out of the picture, yeah, right? Yeah, his dad's out of the picture. Okay. And that's one of the parts with, you know, Jem in the beginning when they first meet Dill, and she's, you know, don't... Boo. Not boo. Uh, Scout. S Scout. I don't know why I always want to call her boo. Because, well, well, boo. Yeah, We're going to get it, to boo Bradley it, soon. It, yeah, it's a little confusing with all the boos in the room. Yeah. So... Uh, when Scout and Jem first meet Dill, and he kind of tells them, you know, my dad, I haven't seen him in a while, and Scout's, you know, you don't have a dad, and Jem kind of has to hit her and say, you know, not everyone is in our position where we have a father. I mean, they don't have a mother. They don't have a mother. So it's kind of reversed where, you know, they don't have the other parent, but they're not making up stories about, you know, someday she's, she'll come back well, instead of... Well, granted, they're, she, they live in the town, Dill don't. I know, but they could have, she could have lied to him, you know, oh, she's, you know, gone on business or gone on an adventure or something. It's, you know, I just it kind of nail in the coffin. I just think it's interesting how, how stark the world is that they're building here. Because it's, 
it's very open with the fact that this town in you know rural Alabama is on the surface that we're seeing you know where in the neighborhood Atticus lives in oh yeah you know this is kind of fine and then you have the then you kind of notice there's no there's no black people in town at all and then we keep going and then we find out that if you're African American here you live in like the shanty towns outside yeah. of town that is apparently very far like they have to like Atticus has to drive out there yeah. it's not like a, a brisk walk and like that's also like the poor side of town because that's where our um oh god the the most evil name in all of in all of uh oh, film I, history i hated that guy what was his name i, I think well okay i know his name is robert e lee something i just can't remember his last name sorry guys we're on imdb <laughs> yeah don't worry don't worry it's probably further up no it's ewell robert oh, e lee ewell bob ewell yeah and that's the and that's a thing when your name is Robert E. Lee anything, mm-hmm. you're you're the paragon of racism in, in the film, right? Yeah. And this guy is like bona fide racist in this movie. Oh, yeah. I think he's the only person who uses the N-word in the entire film. I believe so. Yeah. But I mean, he's not only racist in the film, he attacks children. Yeah, he beats up kids. He's a drunker. He's, he's a vile person. And it... That juxtaposition with Atticus and Gregory Peck's performance mm-hmm. just makes Atticus look like such a better person because, like, we we know that, oh, Atticus, he's a quiet guy, he's yeah. very subdued, but then Ewell spits in his eye, and yeah. we're expecting, oh, this is finally when Atticus is going to take, like, punch this guy out, mm-hmm. he's been this, like mean evil rude racist he's responsible for sending robin tom robbins tom, tom robbins yeah tom to, robinson yeah to his death yeah and atticus just pulls out his handkerchief wipes the spit off his eye and, and walks away from him and gets in the car and i was just like gets in the car and like, drives beat off the shit out of him yes but that's the other thing where it's like he's the bigger person he's the, he's the bigger man in that situation granted i Oh, you got you got to be a pretty big man not to punch somebody out when they spit in your eye, but whatever. Yeah, and I mean, in that scene, Jem's also in the car, and he's also in front of Tom Robinson's house where his wife's in and his children are. And so I think we all know that if, if Atticus took a swing at him, then the whole house behind him are going to jump in, and then Ewell's probably just going to get beaten to death. Which he deserved. Well, yeah. I mean, okay. Should we go into the to the actual case at hand because this this movie I, I know overall is a very well acted film. Yeah, there's really good characterization going on, even from the child actors. And I know this is 1962. We did not expect a lot of child actors. No, I don't think we expect a lot of child actors now. But these are pretty no. pretty good performances, child right? Child actors now have to be you know triple threats. They have to be able to do it all. Back then, it was just. I mean, for Jem, the the actor that played him, he didn't even want to apply for this role. Yeah. His, his mom was just, you know, hey, if you do this, you're going to go for like a half day at school. And he was like, deuces, I'm out. Let's yep. do this. And he landed in one of, you know, the most influential films of all time. Yeah. I think, didn't he pass away not too long ago? I think so. Which is kind of fascinating because I think he would, this movie came out legitimately 60 years ago. Yeah. I don't, I I don't know how many people are still alive from the making of this film. Is this the oldest film we've done on the podcast? Oh, no. No. Oh, no, we did Dracula. I'm dumb. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Dracula's the oldest, right? I believe so. Yeah. Because I think the Marx Brother movies that we did were a little bit later. But... Well, yeah, they, they had, like, full sound and an orchestra. Yeah, so... So this isn't the oldest film that we've done, but... it's I guess it's just because the setting really sells me on it. Yeah, because I'm sure that Scout... I'm pretty sure she's still alive, but I think Jem and Dill have passed on now. Yeah. Which is, I mean, God, they've been pushing 70, 80 now? Yeah, they're in their 70s or 80s. Yeah. So, I, I guess there's a another, like, weird thing is this movie does, like, it feels old, right? Oh, yeah. It transports you back to the 30s. You feel mm. like you're watching, like, a documentary from the 30s. Yeah. And then we get to the part where... Hey guys, I know we're supposed to be in the 30s, but let's commentate on 1960s America real quick. Namely that that court case. Yeah. So, 
I'm gonna just Which open. Was rough. I'm just gonna open with um, the the fact here. The actor Brock Peters that plays Tom Robinson. Mm -hmm. He has, I don't know, three lines in this movie. Yeah. And it's one of the best performances I've ever seen. Oh, hands down. It's, oh my god, it tears your heart out. Yeah, you feel so bad sitting there watching him and just seeing him cry. And then you, you know, you see, like, the behind-the-scenes stuff where Gregory Peck's talking about when he makes his, you know, six-minute speech that he couldn't look at Brock Peters because he, he saw him he crying. He crying. And he was like, if I look at him, I'm going to break and lose it, too. And it's just, that's how strong of an actor Brock Peters is and was able to do with just three lines in this film. Yeah, and it, I, I guess, okay, we're saying three lines, but there's it's like one of them is a whole monologue. Yeah. Which is his, like, testimony. And I think that's, okay, well, whatever. We're going to get to the part everybody actually cares about, so the courtroom scene. Possibly one of the greatest scenes in cinema history. Yeah. Where we, honestly, the you could show just the courtroom stuff Mm -hmm. in any classroom in America, and they would be like, I think people would still be engaged with this, even with everything so fast. It It's such an engaging sequence of cinema. It's engaging. It evokes emotion. It's not like you're just sitting in there kind of like, when is this going to end? It's like, no, you know, when are they going to do the right thing? Yeah. And so we'll get into the actual case. So what happens is that uh, Maylene, I believe is her name, or Mayella? Mayella. Mayella. So, Mayella is um, beaten and raped? Is that what happened? Allegedly. Hap alleged. Okay, she she is beaten, but and, and it's alleged that she was raped. She accuses Tom Robinson um, to have done it, and it goes well, to this big thing. Not only, you know, does she allege that Tom Robinson does it, it's her father that's telling her to tell the police that Tom Robinson did this to her. Yeah, her her father, Robert E. Robert E. Lee Ewell. I'm going to call him by the whole thing, because, don't get me wrong, ham-fisted messaging besides the point. But, so, he is basically the advocate for this whole thing. He is really pushing, it's like, we're going to get Tom Robinson. Yeah. And her testimony is paper thin at best it's very obvious that she can't really give any details as to what happened atticus Be because she doesn't want to admit what really happened exactly and atticus tears it all apart yeah as soon as he starts talking to her he pokes holes in everything about her testimony everything about her story she even presents the fact that her father is way way more likely to have like actually beaten beaten mm -hmm. her where it's like oh he's left-handed and she, it looks like she was beaten by a left-handed man yeah and tom robinson can't even use his left hand nope oh oh wait and it looks to me like you're a very violent drunk when you drink tom robbins is tom robinson as far as anyone knows is a very nice and gentle man He's a family man, just goes to work, comes back home. He he helps her, like, he helps her free of charges because he's like, that seems like the nice thing to do. Mm -hmm. She seemed a little lonely. And, and he felt sorry for her and the courtroom just lost it. Oh, God. Whereas the prosecutor is saying, you, a black man, feeling sorry for a white woman? What is this? What is that? And I'm like, oh, my God, the 60s were not that long ago. And I'm like, bro, wake up. <laughs> oh yeah and then tom robinson gives his testimony yeah is this is this the part that chokes you up every time every single time Just gut wrenching and he goes through it and it's it's okay it feels like he's recounting in a trigger warning it sounds like he's recounting like being raped I mean, he does Because there's yeah. tears. He's trying to, like, hold in all this emotion. He's trying to stop himself from breaking down. And he's like, I went in there. I tried. I was helping her. And she just kissed me. And it's like... And he's just choking out those words. And it's so good. Yeah. Because, I mean, you know, it doesn't go as far as him, him being raped. But I would, you know, call it sexual, you know, like assault or it was a lot of misconduct because you know she kisses him and then she you know grabs him around the waist and that's what I, I it's implied that she was she, trying to reach somewhere else she, she yeah she go she went for the yeah she, she, was, went, she went for the old southern southern mm, handshake yeah she was doing something else and 
Tom Robinson is married and very much not okay with this. I, he, like, turned tails and, and ran. ran, right? And that's when... Yeah, he said that he jumps off of the, the chair. I think he believed... He, I, he, he says, was putting something up on a chair, and she goes and goes yeah. and says hello to the, the ban- bananas and berries. And, like, that's when her dad walks into the room, which also, perfect time. How do dads know... One to walk in when somebody's like reaching or reaching for the reach around. Did he walk in, or I think in the movie they say that he's coming from the field and he sees Tom Robinson run out of the house. I don't know. I think they said he either saw him like through the window or because I think he calls out and that would and that what um, prompts Tom Robinson to bail. No, because I think Tom Robinson bails because she did that. Yeah. So because he said he got scared and he ran, and it's like. Granted, you're in some stranger's house, and they well, they're not sexually really strangers. Ass- I think that's the the other thing. Where to him, he's like, as far as I knew, she was just this you know lonely girl who, you know, asked needed me some to, help. Asked me to you know break things down or remove things from the house. She, so I, it's not like they're it's, stranger strangers, but they're also it's, not it's, friends. It's like a it's like a neighbor, like a, like a good neighbor kind of thing. Cause that's kind how of, that's yeah. how Tom Robinson makes the whole their entire relationship out to be is he she was just like you no know, a good neighborly person or no he was the good neighborly he was a, yeah he was just doing the good neighborly thing to yeah. do and yeah he got himself you know stuck with the crazies exactly and the crazies accuse him of all these things and Atticus lays out the whole case yeah Robinson's testimony mm-hmm. there's not a dry eye in the house no and. Then Atticus Finch delivers one of the greatest speeches in cinematic history. Mm-hmm. I'm, I, I know I keep saying X greatest thing in cinematic history. Like, oh, gra- oh, Atticus Finch, greatest, um, um, greatest hero in American his in film history. You know this movie. Oh, greatest courtroom scene in American history. This speech legitimately might be the greatest like single speech. In, in cinema. There's only, like, two I can think of that might beat it. And it was also done in one take. One take. Er- six minutes total. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing, uh, you know, after the results of, you know, the case come in, how everyone that's in the um, upper deck of the courtroom, they all stand and rise for Atticus well, actually, as, as they, he's walking out. That's the crazy thing. Okay. So, Atticus gives the speech, and I ain't gonna lie to you, that kind of speech... If they did that, if they did that now, it'd be there'd be a mistrial because there there's no way you can convict a man after that speech. No, it's oh my god, so much passion and pushes the entirety yeah. of humanity. He mm-hmm. puts humanity on trial there. Yeah, and we come up short because the jury comes back and Tom Robinson guilty as charged. Everybody's like no, and they take Tom Robinson away to the jail. Everybody on the bottom row, because everybody who's able to sit in the court on the bottom level, those are all, you know, the white people get up, mm-hmm. they leave, they're like, oh, yeah, we, you know, oh, we got Tom Robinson, oh, mm-hmm. obviously he did it. But what about all those, like, testimonies and the holes in our story? Ah, it's fine. Mm-hmm. And everybody in the upper deck, and I, I know this is, like, an antiquated term, and it's also, like, has roots in, like, racist yeah. caricaturing, but up in the crow's nest, yeah, they're... Because that, I think legitimately that's what those levels were called back then. But, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, so they're up there. It's, you know, that's all the black people in town who came in to, to see this. And they all sit. And they all wait. And this is, that's a moment of mourning. Yeah. And then the entire courtroom clears out. And then, you know, Atticus Finch packs up his briefcase and walks out. And this, this is the moment that gets me every time. When the, the, the minister, the Baptist, you know... Mm-hmm. Leans over to Scout and says, "You know, stand up. Your daddy's passing." Yeah. And that, and then they all stand up, and then, oh, oh, god damn, Atticus, this world's too good for you. God damn it. And people think it's like, oh man, that's that's the end of the movie. No, there's well, another like twenty minutes. Yeah, this movie keeps going, and you know, it's not only heartbreaking that this man is falsely accused, falsely convicted, convicted of this crime. And, you know, it jumps, you know, to present day where this is still happening. And, you know, from the 60s, it's happened with so many cases where, you know, you're finding out people that have been in prison for 30, 40 years are getting out because 
Oh, the, DNA exonerated them. DNA, or they finally got the truth from, you know, the, the people that were accusing them, you know, well, he never laid a hand on me. I just said this, and it's just... Oh, God. It's, there's so, there's it's so many horrific. Case, there's so many cases of... I, I, okay, again, I don't, I don't want to be that guy or be political. It is not a political podcast in any way. No. But there's a bunch of stories you can look up where it's people who are like, yes, he assaulted me, or it was rape, or da-da-da, and it and it turns out DNA evidence, like, 30 years later, wasn't him. Mm-hmm. There there was, um, I guess, is kind of a bad example, because I believe the gentleman is now back in prison for another crime. Mm-hmm. But in that uh, show, Making a Murderer, yeah. the guy went to prison for, like, 15 years because a woman accused him of, uh, like, beating and raping her. And then mm. they find out, oh, no, it was, a, it was a different guy. Yeah. Granted, the guy who did go to prison was also a shitty human being. Mm-hmm. Because I think when he got out, he murdered a woman in like within the first year of getting out. But whatever. But this is not Tom's case in the not movie. Not Tom's case. And it's so tragic that he's you know accused and imprisoned for this, and then we find out he doesn't even make it through the night. Nope. They take him. Okay. This is a question I've always had with this movie because this is when I have that balancing act of cynicism and hope. Mm-hmm. Because they, Tom Robinson, they take him to, they're going to take him to, to actual, like, jail. Like, actual, like, prison. And they're going to take him to a secure location first. So, he's out of the town. There's no threat. Because earlier in the movie, when he is in the regular town jail, Atticus actually sits out in front of his cell to, with his lamp and his book to make sure that no one harms him in the middle of the night. And people show up. They're going to lynch Tom Robinson. They, it's led by Robert Yule. And, and They've got shotguns, and they're just ready to be a firing squad on this poor guy, and, and Atticus just will not move. Well, and then, no, and then Scout and Jem show up, and and Scout talks to one of the guys, and he's like, hey, Mr. Whatever your name is. Like, she talks to him, and she's like, how you doing? I hope you're, you know, I hope we had your son over for dinner. I hope I can see you soon. And then and I know, and it, you can see the shame and in I know that man's it, eyes. And I know that scene is considered controversial. I've read some things where people are like, Oh, you know, look, a little white girl saved this man that's, you know, being imprisoned for this. And it's like, the way I, you know, view it is that it's that phrase, you know, out of the mouth of babes, where these men are trying to kill this man because they think, oh, he raped a white woman. And you have this child come up and, you know, well, I go to school with your son and, you know, he's very nice. And And we had him over for dinner. and And it's fascinating because Scout seems almost completely unaware of the situation unfazed that they're all armed she yeah she just she does i don't even think she understands that they're here to 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 do anything yeah i think she i think she honestly believes that they just showed up to say hi to her dad i think that's what she honestly believes and she's talking to because jem's very aware that something bad is going on he refuses to leave his dad he's gonna stand by him good or bad yeah and it's fast, and that's a fascinating sequence. And mm-hmm. people who say, "Oh, it's controversial, little little white girl, whatever," and I'm like, "That's not the point of the scene." She's talking to this to this man, who, granted, he's rallied in by all this hatred. And yeah. He's gonna he's gonna go do this, and in that moment when she's talking to him like a human being, he realizes that like, I am ashamed of to be here. I yeah, because... every everything in my being right now was full of hate not five minutes ago and i i am horrible for being here with with these people and yeah. he and he prompts everyone to leave he just leaves he's like i he just i'm turns going around. home yeah because uh we can't think of the character's name right now but yeah, earlier he in only the film, shows up for this scene and then right at the beginning <laughs> yeah um we see him in the very beginning of the movie and for this scene but there's also an altercation with scout and his son mm-hmm. where she beats him up in the middle of the schoolyard because I don't know, he was where he didn't, you know... He was making fun of her in a... In a, in in a, a dress. dress. Yeah. And, you know, he was in beat-up overalls compared to some of the other kids that were... Other boys that were wearing suits or, you know, better quality overalls. And a gem was just kind of like, 
they don't have money. You know, they're, they're poor. They're, is, they're dirt poor. Yeah. People so, don't understand what dirt poor is. Yeah. You don't understand dirt poor until you live in a barn in Alabama. That's real dirt poor. Yeah. And that's when they invite him over to have dinner with them. And he's just so excited to be there for dinner. And he asks for syrup because he's going to put them over his pork chops. He puts them all over everything. And, and, and Scout has a whole thing about yeah, she, it. Yeah, she gets and, so upset and Calpurnia pulls her out into the kitchen and she's just like, you don't know what it's like to be in someone else's shoes. And if he wants to, you know, eat the, the tablecloth off your table, he is your guest. You let him do that. And it's it goes in, this movie is about just, like, there's like a whole acceptance thing going on yeah. here. And, okay. We gotta get to the, to the end of the movie here. Because... Yeah. The end of the movie is where everything kind of reaches its its head, right? Everything just explodes. Yeah, and it starts with Scout going to her school pageant dressed as a fucking ham. She's literally a ham. Literally a ham. And her and her brother Jed, they're going back, they're walking through the woods to get back to to their house and, and then Boo, or boo, sorry. Scout is in her ham costume because someone stole take, her clothes. Takes her clothes from the school. So. Irrelevant. She's in a ham costume. Yeah. So, and then after seeing one, she takes the costume off. It's like, why couldn't you walk home like that? It's dark. It was the 1930s, and those were considered undergarments. That, and it's like your brother's with you. He can't give you his coat. It's gonna, you know, at it least. It is go- the 1930s. That is considered <sighs> improper. I guess, even though they're walking through the woods to get home, but... And that leads to them getting attacked! Attacked in the middle of the night, in the woods, and, you know, you're just thinking, what the hell is going on here? You know, even, you know, this small town... It's even filmed weird. It's even filmed to show you as little as possible. Yeah, and I mean, we see it from Scout's perspective, too, where she's seeing out of the ham costume, and it's just this small cutout around her eyes, so she can't see on either side of her. She can only see straight ahead. Yeah. And it's just so disorienting seeing Jem getting beaten up and not knowing who's doing it. Not even knowing what's really going on. She's yeah. just hearing a struggle. And then, and then she somebody gets else comes. Yeah, she gets thrown. Then somebody else comes in after Jem gets knocked un- knocked unconscious. Yeah. And there's another tussle. And then uh, this person who comes in and, and saves them basically carries Jem, Jeb home to, to, the Atticus. Ha- to Atticus and... And scouts like they're trying to they're talking to the sheriffs like what's going on la 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 and we find out what happens is that Robert Robert Ewell Robert E Lee Ewell again mm. yeah that mm. guy got pissed drunk and wandered out into the woods and he's kind of like I'm gonna beat them them kids Atticus didn't give me the satisfaction of a fight I guess mm-hmm. and taking out on his kids because he's an evil bastard yeah and this character that we have not seen yet in the movie but no. he's been mentioned he's been talked about. Um, Boo Radley, who, who is, is the, the neighborhood boogeyman. Yeah, which is is fascinating because all the parents acknowledge that yeah, Boo Boo is a real thing. He yeah. lives in the the Radley house. He doesn't come out. You stay away from that house. Yeah, it, it's like any neighborhood where you know your parents tell you, you know what, stay away from that house. Don't deal with the people that live in that house. The, yeah, you know, so we can all identify with that. You know, having. The, the haunted house or the scary house or, you know, the killer that lives down the street. Yeah. Which 99.9% of the times is utter bullshit. Yeah. Your parents just don't want you going into an abandoned house. Pretty much. But this one's real. And the Boo Radley, like the scout has been like leaving little knickknacks in like the tree outside of the house. Well, no. Uh, uh, Boo, Boo's Boo, been leaving knickknacks. Boo's knick-knacks. leaving it and scout's the one that's been finding these little things in the tree and we meet Mr. Radley, who decides to cement over the tree. Mm-hmm. And we're hearing, you know, from the parents, stay away from the Radley. So it's not like just stay away from Boo. Also stay away from the parents. Yeah. And, and, we, you're, and you're, we find out why. Yeah. Because we find out that Boo Radley um, was, I guess, following the kids or wandering around in, at night. Because that's the only time he goes outside is at yeah. night when yeah. no one can see him. And he hears the struggle, goes in, and he kills Robert Ely Ewell. Yeah. You know, defend, defending the kids. Yeah. And he picks him up and takes him home. And we find out the reason why, you know, the parents all know. It's like, hey, don't go over to the, the Radley house. Mm-hmm. Don't go near Boo. Is because he's he's mentally deficient. He's, um, I don't know what it is exactly. Uh, from what I was reading, some people are thinking maybe he's, like, on the, the spectrum of being autistic. Some, maybe. So. I, it'd be pretty severe because he doesn't speak. He's very much like he doesn't seem to be that 
in the moment as to like what's going on he's not really engaged and you know again this being the 30s i don't know when autism was discovered well put on a put on a like a medical spectrum it's yeah probably a, like it's probably been a thing it's just again like we've widened the spectrum since then so he yeah. was probably just considered again um men, like mental i think the term was mentally defective yeah and this is also 1962 it is is still there, 60 years ago. Yeah, there, there was a lot of medical information that still needed to be discovered and fine-tuned, but... And it goes into this great thing where the sheriff... And this is my thing, you know, the cynicism and hope. Because with Tom Robinson's death, you know, we have... That's, that's like cynicism. It's like, I don't have any hope in humanity. And then the sheriff, when, you know, Atticus is like, look, we'll take this to court. There's no, this man will get off on self-defense, clear case. Mm -hmm. And the sheriff is like, look, your boy was unconscious. Your daughter said she didn't see anything. Mm -hmm. And Atticus is like, but justice will prevail. And the sheriff's like, justice has been served. Just let him go home. Yeah. And that, that's the moment there where I'm like, there's, there is that tinge of hope in humanity there where the sheriff's not going to charge Boo, Boo Radley. No. And it's like that come up in moment in the movie where it's like, oh, oh, Robert E. Lee Yule, that old nasty racist guy has come up. And, but it's like, it's still really bittersweet, right? Because yeah, it comes at the cost of the innocence of this, essentially this giant child. Yeah. The innocence of him, the innocence of Jem and Scout, uh, Tom Robinson, who had to lose his life because. You know, Robert Yule accused him of raping his daughter. So yeah. a lot of people lost and, you know, karma came in and took Robert Yule out of the picture. So and even then, I feel like this must like, OK, because this is this movie or this month is about heroes. Right. And yeah. we have Atticus. Yeah. Do you think at the end of this movie, Atticus still believes in the law and justice? I think he does, but I, I don't think he sees it as, you know, that it's one way or the other. There's, you know, there's a bit of grayscale in between it. Okay, because I wonder if that's the arc for him. Because yeah. I feel at the beginning that he's like, there's there's good, there's bad, there's black, and there's white. And then throughout the film, he learns that there is gray in there where... yeah. You don't always find justice in the law, mm -mm. which also goes into like a really weird thing about vigilante justice. But I, again, not a politics podcast, yeah. not about that shit. But yeah, so I guess that that's that's my thoughts on the movie currently. Yeah, and you know we also get Atticus, who is very straight laced, and you know you do as I tell you, you do as Calpurnia tells you, and we kind of see him start to break as the movie goes and the only time we ever really see him lose it is when he finds out that tom robinson has passed yeah because i mean you know he tries to be as strong as he can he doesn't hit robert yule when he really wants to but as soon as he finds out that news he breaks he's yeah he breaks and then we see him you know turn into a frantic parent when uh gems brought home you know beaten up broken arm so we really see him kind of become you know, less, you know, straight laced to real person. I think you feel, and that's interesting because, all right, I don't know about you, but there is that kind of aspect when you think about your parents from when you were a kid mm -hmm. and your parents are super, you're like, your your dad is Superman when you're a little kid or your mom's, you know, Wonder Woman when you're mm -hmm. a little kid. And I wonder if this movie is the story of Scout realizing her, her dad's not Superman. He's a real person. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, go, go, go cinematic dads. Go there. All yeah, right. and, you know, we kind of leave the movie with Atticus not only being the hero in the movie, because he's not the only hero. We have, he's the hero, uh, Tom Robinson, who, you know, faced trial, faced the ultimate sacrifice. I don't, I don't know if I would, that's, a, that's the thing that keeps coming back to me, because the sheriff says, oh yeah, Tom Robbins took, like, ran, we told him to stop, he didn't. I, we fired a shot to stop him, and we killed him on accident. And, and how, do that, we, how do we know that that really happened? That's the question. Did it? That's what we don't know. We and don't. That, and, that's the, and that's a part of this movie that I almost don't 
ever want to know the answer to. Yeah, because be- it would be too heartbreaking to know that one of the cops just laid him out right then and there. And, oh, yeah, he tried to run. Or or, or he actually did try to run. He didn't. He It could have been a thing where he's just like, I have no more faith in this society anymore. He has no more faith yeah. in Atticus. And he's like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to just run and see how far I it's can get. It's not even faith in Atticus. It's just faith in society. You know, it's, I'm always going to have this red mark on me. I got to get out of here. I got to get my wife and kids out of here and protect us. So that's why I deem him a hero because he had to face this horrific thing to be faced with. And he paid the ultimate price. But at the same time, he seemed to be, you know, a loving husband and a loving father who was just trying to do right by his family. And it's fascinating. It's fascinating we get that. When, again, he only has, like, three lines in the movie. I don't think he really talks about his, himself. No. He, he does. He does. He, my testimony. Mm-hmm. His, like, his great testimony. Yeah. He, ha- he talks to Atticus for, like, a little bit. And I think that's it. That's bo- more, more or less mm-hmm. his entire, like, on-screen persona. Everything else we draw from him is kind of what other people say about him. Yeah. And it's, again fascinating there's not a bad performance in this movie and i deem my third hero uh boo radley yeah because he was this you know ghost this menacing figure and at the end of the day he really wasn't that person he went out and he saved two children from granted a drunken rapist it's true granted he did it it's also said he he knifed his dad for you know stopping playing with his toys so yeah he i think boo radley is actually dangerous but yeah. i think in this instance like i i couldn't heart seeing another trial case with with that going mm-hmm. on because that would i think that would be the case if atticus did take it on yeah and it went the same way as tom robinson that that would break him yeah but yeah boo so i final thoughts great movie heartbreaking movie so if you plan on watching it haven't seen it bring a box of tissues yes and honestly i think this is again probably is the greatest cinematic hero i could think of because again atticus finch like i said at the beginning he's not superman he's not a fantasy knight he is just the epitome of a good decent man and, and I'm going to call it heroes because I think there was more than just one hero in this movie once we got to the very end. Well, I thought you were going to say it because of next week, Boo. What are we going to be watching next week? Well, next week, we're not going to be so serious. I think this is the only serious film in this uh, theme month of ours. Yes, because I was tired of watching blockbusters and fancy stuff. I wanted to, I wanted to go back to my roots. Black and white pretentious films. AFI Top 100. Yes, ma'am. Oscar winning, Pulitzer Prize winning. But next week is a different story because there's going to be a little bit more adventure next week. So make sure you bring your hats and your bullwhips because we're going to be talking about Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is celebrating a big anniversary this month. Or this year, actually. Yes, it is. And honestly, I cannot wait. I have done... Raiders of the Lost Ark on a different podcast, the Double Feature Podcast. That it was, was our first episode. That was your first episode. Yes, we did Back to the Future and Raiders of the Lost Ark to debate the best '80s blockbuster. And in that in that one, you know, Raiders came a little short in terms of the best of the '80s blockbusters because I advocated for Back to the Future to well, my dying. Of course, diaper. you did. I gave an Atticus Finch style style speech in that in that podcast. I remember that episode was like two three hours. Yes. But I'm very excited because I do love me some good Indiana Jones. Me too. He's a teacher. He kicks ass. Looks good in a hat. He does. So yeah, but where could they listen to us if they wanted to catch that one next week? Well, if you want to follow us on social media, we are on Instagram and Facebook at the Film Club Podcast. And if you want to listen to us on a different platform than you currently are, we are on Anchor FM, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and just about everywhere the podcasts are streamed. Would you like to plug your other podcast? I think I already did, but I'll do it one more time. You can also listen to me on the Double Feature Podcast or the Double Feature Picture Show you can find that on our YouTube channel, In The Frame. And on there, me and my buddy David basically bring two movies together, compare them, contrast them, talk about them in context with each other, and kind of what they do in terms of like cinema, cinematic language, and their place in the culture. I think the 
biggest ones we're doing for the month of July is sci-fi. And I think our first episode this month is going to be something, something complete. I don't know. I forget things. It's going to be good. I know we're doing Wrath of Khan and Empire Strikes Back because I just watched those ones. And I'm very excited. Well, we'll catch you next week at the film club. Peace.